spiritual uh, or transpersonal factors into account, okay, because they're considered not real. And uh, of course, uh, in the shamanic traditions worldwide, that's not the case. Well, they recognize that we're at least four dimensional beings, spirit, mind, uh, heart, feelings, and body. You can think those are the four primary dimensions, the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual, or the soul. And the shamanic traditions encompass all four. And so does alchemy. I think of alchemy as the uh, kind of a Western expression of the shamanic work and attitude. I think of shamanism, yoga, and alchemy as being three sort of multidimensional traditions of transformation of every level. So the and divination is the process of asking a question and receiving answers from one ordinary sources. We know it in the form of like the Torah or astrology or the I Ching and things like that, where you have some kind of outer method of throwing coins and, uh, to uh, get the personal element out of your questioning. Uh, and uh, and uh, so, but in its essence, it involves connecting to the wise self or the knowing self within you and obtaining answers to your questions in that regard. And my, my approach to psychotherapy, this kind of integrated psychotherapy would be to, and, and whether, or not it's, whether or not it's amplified with the psychedelic substances. Uh, I consider the psychedelic substances amplified, it's a non-specific amplified, where the drug effect consists in amplifying the awareness. But the content of the awareness is not a function of the drug, you see. The content is not given by the drug, the content is given by you. <laughs> Actually, the set, the intention, and the set. So this book, this book talks about accessing your spiritual intelligence for healing and guidance. Those are the two main uh, purposes worldwide that people can use shamanic methods. Uh, and, he, and this is true of the modern world too. Healing or psychotherapy, you know, all the healing modality, all is in some way involved going to the past and finding the causes and the origins of the illness or the problem. And then whether it's a virus or a bacteria or a complex or whatever it is, and then bringing the healing consciousness into the present. Not just going into the past and saying that. That's, that's the really thing, you see. You have to go into the past and bring it forward to the present. And then to the nation, the guidance means going into the future, anticipating where you want to go and where you are going, not like a goal for your life or a goal for your relationship, and then bringing that back into your present. So that's the donation. And then mind stream, mind space and time stream, um, the understanding and navigating your states of consciousness. I think the different states of consciousness that differ in how time and space are perceived. How the, that's the way you tell the difference in a different time, in a different state of consciousness. Time and space are different, are subjective essentially, and determined by subjective factors. Of course, we have clocks and measurements of time and so forth, uh, but it's completely different. You see, I'll give you an example of that. If you have a dream, you're traveling, uh, you're going to visit your mother, your grandmother, she lives uh, thousands of miles away, and it would take many, many hours to travel there, and you can go and have a dream, and dream of having a conversation with her, a heart-to-heart -heart talk, and it doesn't take any time whatsoever. It's subjective time, and you don't have to go through any space. In the, in, the, in the space of dream time. All of the drugs, uh, especially the consciousness extending drugs, have a completely different uh, uh, time and space uh, parameters. And this is one of the things I think that will in future lead us to rethink the physics of time and space. Because there's a lot, a lot of physics of time and space that we don't understand. So now, uh, yes, uh, so uh, I want, I'm experimenting here with uh, I want to uh, combine sort of visual graphic and presentations with poetic uh, and quotes. This is a quote from Albert Hoffman, one of my heroes, from this autobiography. What we call reality is the product of a reciprocal interaction between material and energetic signals being emitted from the external world and the conscious living self in the inner world of the human being. In other words, there's an external world, but there's also an internal world. And Heraclitus, the great philosopher, pointed out that the inner world, 
the reality, the psyche is as limitless as the external world. The psyche is as infinite in its extent as the external reality. Modern science does not recognize that. The modern science thinks the psyche is not real. Interesting. Okay, let's do the next slide. And here, a similar perspective from the Dalai Lama. If the scientific study of consciousness is ever to grow in full maturity, given that subjectivity is a primary element of consciousness, it will have to incorporate a fully developed and rigorous methodology of first-person comparison. The, uh, uh, in, in the Western world, especially in psychology dominated by the English traditions, consciousness, you can't study consciousness because it's subjective, you see. But actually, you see, it's starting in the 60s, it's through the discoveries of the psychedelic consciousness they call it not, that, and then through the study of dream and correlating external measurements of the brain with, uh, and which is still the main Western approach to the study of consciousness, is to study consciousness and study the correlations of external measurements, whether it's EEG or heart rate or whatever it is, which is fine, which is great. Uh, but that's not the only way to study consciousness. See, the Western, the Eastern tradition have developed thousands and thousands of years of meditative structure, systematic internal observation. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So it's useful to state uh, of four primary states of awareness that we always have. The more is called ongoing, but we may not always be connected to all of them, or we're connected to some of them only partially. One is mental. And uh, ideas and thoughts and cognitive processing. One is visual images, plus sounds and smells, sensory impressions. And uh, some people believe, and this may be true, at least in part, that uh, ideas and thoughts are more, you know, oriented, uh, uh, localized in the left or hemisphere of the brain, the visual images and other imagistic, more <coughs> things on the right side of the brain. And then we have feelings and emotions. They're not located in the brain at all. I, I don't know if they're located anywhere, but traditional theorists would say they're located more in the heart, in the heart center, in this area. And then we say, I feel, you know, love towards you, or I feel fear, blah, 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 like that. They're, they're not like thoughts, they're quite different. Although we sometimes use an expression like that, my feeling about this is, that's actually a misnomer. The uh, person who said, my feeling about this is expressing an opinion, <laughs> not a feeling. You know, therapists work with that all the time. But what do you actually feel, you see? A language of feeling is kind of primitive and cruel. And then the final, the fourth strand, I would say body sensations. And that's <coughs> not just, you know, we don't just have five senses. Some traditions say we have 49 different sense modality. Think of you can have a body sense of temperature, for example, you can have a body sense of texture. You can have a body sense of weight. You can have a body sense of uh, movement. None of them go through the five senses that they would normally see. So think about the multi-sensory awareness. And that's one of the things that happens in the psychedelic uh, substances. So let's look at this. I'm just going to present with you some, some um, visual images of uh, ideas that I, I use and discuss in my books. Uh, you're all familiar with the different chakras and the in the traditional seven yoga chakras and uh, there, there are many traditions, both Eastern and Western and Arhanika, and there's a lot more than seven chakras. Uh, you can see here, there's chakras above the head, there's chakras between the legs. Um, so, um, the chakras are energy centers and uh, roughly one can think of them, as, and this is found in Taoism and other areas too, I think rather than focusing so much on the individual chakras, I think it's more useful to think of the three chambers, each of them having chambers. And the middle chamber I call the cave of the heart would be like where feeling awareness is generally located. I mean, it's, these are, these are uh, approximations of where feelings can be located anywhere in your body. You can feel them, you can have feelings in your head, like when you have a headache, for example. And, uh, uh, but generally speaking, the heart. You know, and we have all the emotional language of the heart. And this is the heart center, it's not the physical organ, the heart. It's the heart center. The center, which is the center of the chest. The energy center. They're not anatomical structures, and we're not going to find them in the corpse. Uh, when, you, when the physical body dies, the energy centers leave. Uh, and enter into another form, see. And then 
uh, the center of the head, we should be more like thinking awareness, uh, thinking and imagery awareness, as we saw. And then the energy center of the cauldron, the lower abdomen, would be like body awareness. Like, I have a gut level feeling, you said, or you know, uh, an instinctual feeling, including sexual and other kinds of processes of food and digestion and da da da, all those things. And of course, they're subject to physical and of course, it's psychological, and we have all the psychosomatic illnesses. And the basic idea of yoga, shamanism, and alchemy, and in terms of the healing, is to bring these different centers and aspects of our nature into a harmonious function with one another. Uh, because disharmony and disconnect between the function gives us a feeling of dis-ease and un discomfort. And uh, when the thinking processes are different than the feelings and things like that. Okay, let's uh, go to the next slide. This is the opening verse of Dante's uh, uh, Divina Commedia. In the middle of the journey of this our life, I found myself in a dark forest and did not know the right way. And uh, it's kind of what we call nowadays the midlife crisis. <laughs> you know? But then it has a, it has a good uh, outcome because then he meets a guy, Dante. And the guy takes them on a tour of reality, starting with the inferno going down, 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 and my level of hell, or is it 13, I forget, and then up to the purgatory, the mountain of purgatory, and then up to the paradiso. Uh, it's interesting that he calls it a comedy. A comedy. A divine comedy. It's uh, not a tragedy of life, it's a comedy of life. Uh, which I like that, I don't know about you. Okay, let's do the next slide. Uh, so this is a model I use, and I call it a heuristic model. A heuristic model means it's useful to look at things that way. It's not saying this is like the way it actually is. It's not, I'm not claiming any reality for this. I'm not claiming any connection to particular brain centers. They may be there. So it's the idea of the set and the setting. Uh, uh, the setting, the environmental, physical, and social context of your state of consciousness. The state of consciousness itself is defined by a division of time. It has a start and it has a beginning. It may last an hour, it may last five hours, it may last five minutes. You're in a state of consciousness right now, did you know that? It's called the waking state. You're in that state from the time you wake up to the time you fall asleep. Pretty much then you're in a sleeping state and a dreaming state. So, but the un unusual states that we have, so the four usual states, uh, the waking state, the sleeping state, and the dreaming state, which are different, they have different brains, different brain And, uh, uh, and, uh, and what the Vedanta tradition calls the Turiya, which is the fourth state, the kind of a meditative state in which alpha waves may be regularly and your eyes are closed and you kind of meditate. Uh, those are the four ordinary states that we cycle through every day. So it's, Wrong to call them all the same, they're not altered. They're, they're about as normal as you can get. Uh, I mean, they're altered to, in relationship to the state you were in before, uh, but they're not altered in terms of some. That's why I don't use the term altered state anymore after all these years because it's, it's like, you know, an altered animal is like a castrated animal. It's kind of disgusting because it implies a state of normality and a value judgment that's better to be normal. And it's not better to be normal. Whatever, however you define normal, which is itself subjective, <laughs> you see. But if you, thought that you use the idea of a state of consciousness which lasts a certain time in relationship, and you compare it to the state before and the state after. That's the crucial distinction. So in a state of consciousness, you have changes in thinking, feeling, perception, sense of time and space. That's the most crucial one. And the change of body image and sense of self. When you think of, because you might have a change of ideas, and you might have a change of feeling, a change of heart, and not really be in a different state. You know, it's, uh, everything still looks the same. But if you take this drug, and then your reality somehow looks completely differently, and the walls, which were normally solid, start waving and undulating, and, uh, uh, and the floor starts undulating, then you realize, well, I'm really in an altered state right now. Going back to MDMA or ecstasy, MDMA I should say, that's the beautiful advantage of why MDMA is the best work, uh, one to work with in terms of trauma, much better than LSD or psilocybin in my opinion. Because uh, somebody who's been traumatized by some extreme 
still keeps turning on, right? Or is that me? Right? But keep it close. So, um, uh, if you can traumatize in a battle zone, for example, you don't want to be changing your reality. The same thing. You need to be able to focus on this reality, what's actually happening right now. So you don't have the flashbacks of suddenly being in a war zone and you know, having to defend yourself. So it happens to you, poor guys, and they suddenly they hear a weird noise and they suddenly start shooting everything that moves. Okay, so getting back to the idea of the, um, the uh, set in the setting, that was Leary's insight, the set, the intention, in terms, but I actually now think that set is the most important thing, because the set or intention determines the set that you're going to choose, you see. If your intention is to do therapy, then you choose a therapeutic setting. And like the therapists who are working with them, the they, they choose not a clinic and not a laboratory, but a comfortable room where with furniture and music and painting and and, uh, and they go into, you know, they have eye shades and things to do this so they can go within without being disturbed. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to fill out any questionnaires. That comes after this. Not for us, not an experimental setting. It's a healing setting. What will contribute to the healing is the therapy. And um, so, um, and then there's always a trigger. As I mentioned, the trigger of an old state can be uh, physical variations, like you wake up and you move into the waking state. And then there's, it's useful to think about the consequences. What are the changes that happen in the way of thinking afterwards? <coughs> my core formula, my equivalent of E equals MC squared, because this says that your uh, awareness, what you're aware of, is a function of what you're attending to, and that is a function of your intention or your question. So, um, you have, we, you have the intention to come and listen to me talk. I have the intention to talk with you. So we, come, we came together in this setting for that purpose. Now, if uh, our attention, and so you're attending, for which I thank you once again, and um, you're giving me your attention, it's interesting in, in, in English, you say, pay attention. It's, just, it's not just passively receiving, it's either actually doing something. You pay it. In, in German, they say, Shakti of Mesomet, it's a gift. It's the same idea, you're actually actively giving something. And, uh, but our attention, your attention, our, our attention, could be captured. For example, if a naked woman or man walked you know, into the room, <laughs> our attention would be captured by that event. Or if there was a loud noise, it would be captured, an explosion or something like that. But other than that, it's given by intention. This has tremendous significance for the study of psychedelic states. Uh, because you want to arrange a psychedelic session to get the most out of a session, you arrange a ritual setting of some kind where you can pay attention to what's going on inside and you reduce the external stimulation. You're not going to have the television on, you're not going to have newspapers lying around, you're not going to have the children run in and out, you're not going to have all the usual things that may capture your attention in your video. You're withdrawn from that setting. Much like when you do a meditation course, you withdraw from your everyday life and you focus on what's going on in your mind because that's your intention. See, I, I don't see personally, from my experience, that there is much value to be had to just take one of these consciousness defending drugs and just take it and see what it does without paying attention to what you are doing or not doing. <laughs> and what the setting is, and what's your intention, why are you doing this, and who are you doing it with, you see, that's also part of the environment. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, so this is the idea of uh, what does it mean to expand awareness? So if you if you think of uh, our ordinary awareness of being a kind of a circle, it's a diagram. But actually, I think it would be more accurate to represent it as a sphere, because we're all energy beings. We have this physical body, and we have an energy field. That's as much of our personality, actually, our physical being, it's the physical energy field that extends from many feet in every direction, 12 to 15 or 20 feet or more, in every direction. Uh, and it's 
this is invisible, but this certainly can be sensed. For example, you go in a crowded elevator, you know, everybody's standing like this. Because you're all inside everybody else. You're actually inside other people. That's why people are very polite, they don't make big movements or anything like that. Or some, you know, some thing. So um, we know this all the time. We get a feel, something else walks into the room, we get a feel for that person. And different, we can identify them. You can identify the people you you could do this experiment, you could close your eyes right now and you could probably feel the person sitting next to you or the two people sitting next to you. You know, you could kind of sense them, you become aware of their sensing. So, you think of the, the ordinary sphere, poss possible sphere of your awareness being a circle rather than a sphere, sort of a cross section. And then when you contract your awareness, um, then that's called focusing. Your focus, if your ordinary sphere of awareness is like 30 degrees, if you contract and you focus, you concentrate. That's what focusing is, concentrate. So, like the example, you know, your concentration could be captured, or you're con concentrating here uh, on the, I'm concentrating on this sort of angle of you, you guys. But again, you, you know, it could expand further out, and you could become aware of noises and so forth and so on. So that's true. Uh, so it's a, it's a diagrammatic, schematic way of thinking about the uh, uh, notion of contraction of awareness. Uh, it's not a bad thing at all. It's a normal function. And then let's do the next slide. By contrast, uh, so, so by contrast, the normal state is 30 degrees, the contracted state 5 degrees or 10 degrees. Uh, the expanded state might be 120 degrees. Or maybe on your own. 360 degrees. Now, one of the things that people report when, when they first take a psychedelic, they say, oh, I, I can see all around me. <laughs> I can see with the back of my head. <laughs> or I can feel what's going on behind me. And, and clairvoyance and clairsentient people get naturally gifted with extended perception. Say the same thing. Uh, so, I want, and what I'm doing here is normalizing the notion of expansion and contraction of consciousness. It's something that we do all the time. It happens every day, many times, and it happens with our intention, and it may or may not happen also unintentionally. And that can lead to problems. Uh, in fact, you can think of obsessions, uh, what psychiatrists call obsessions, compulsions, addiction, as involuntary contraction. I mean, and involuntary and repeated contractions of consciousness. There's nothing wrong with drinking and focusing attention on the effect of alcohol on your mind. But if you do that increasingly, and it takes up more and more of your time and your family and your energies, then you're a problem, as you know. So, he who holds no preferences for or against anything, or anyone, the ways of why open to the world, So if you're not holding, I mean, you can't have opinions, but you're not holding the opinions or the preferences, then you're not stuck in them, you see. So it's possible to drink alcohol, and it's possible to smoke tobacco, and it's possible to take drugs of various kinds in a normal way and not be attached to them. Okay, so the next slide. So this is another way of looking at consciousness. There are many, basically, actually, there are, I think, a few different paradigms of looking at consciousness. One of them is the state, the notion of a state of consciousness that lasts for a certain time. This, this notion, I'm thinking of it as something, a quality that's added to an ordinary function. For example, the first pair is perception and apperception. Apperception is a very interesting word. It means perceiving something and perceiving a sort of a halo of significance and marginally related phenomena. There was a, when I was at Harvard, well, there still is in psychology, or something called the thematic apperception test, where you're shown, the TAT, where you're shown pictures of ambiguous scenes, like a man standing there making a gesture like this, and a woman is sitting there like that, and, but there's no text. And then you read into that test what's going on. So it's called thematic apperception. What, what are you perceiving? And it's different for everybody. You see, like that. It tells you something about what you're projecting. It's a protection test, what you're projecting into the scene. So, um, uh, so you're adding the context in that. Now, I distinguish sympathy and empathy in that way. 
uh, the facility I think of as an or is an automatic function, it's an unconscious reaction. Animals have it. You know, your dog feels sympathy for you when you decide or move about in a way and they come and smell the keep you from the like that. Animals have sympathy, they've shown that many, many times. That's why we love them, you know, one of the reasons we love them, they're always sympathetic <laughs> to whatever is happening with them. And uh, if you're sad, they're sad with you. And they're always happy to be there. Empathy is different from sympathy because it involves a conscious choice. Uh, sympathy is like two strings resonating together automatically. Empathy is like, has a diff an additional element of conscious awareness and still recognition of where diff we're two different people. Uh, a little story would illustrate that you're walking down the street and uh, there's a hole in the ground in the sidewalk and there's a person down in the hole, 10 feet down. And uh, you, you have sympathy, you jump down in the hole with them. So then you have two people going in the hole. <laughs> That's the whole idea of a misery loves company. Yeah, misery loves company, but um, it doesn't help. The company doesn't necessarily help to get out of the misery. It makes it a slightly more bearable. Uh, empathy would be, oh, you're in the hole. Let me get a ladder. <laughs> or let me get a rope, right? We must feel lonely down there or difficult. So I like, thought that's the difference. And uh, knowledge and understanding are commonly understood. Knowledge is knowledge. You can learn it, you can measure it, you can get it from books. Understanding is quite different. It has an element of like, really getting it, really understanding it from your inner self. Um, reaction and response. The automatic reaction. Uh, you touch the stove and pull the pull back, reflex action, doesn't require any thought. Uh, the response would be like you're choosing, that's the intention, the intention, consciously designing, like that. And um, then you can think of going down the habitual thinking and mindful thinking. See, habitual thinking is just work, it's just like the, the thinking program of the brain just going through its routine. People have estimated we have about, the average person has about 2,000 two thoughts that they repeat over and over. They think of the same thoughts, kind of repetitive. It's sort of like the brain, think of it this way, the brain emits thoughts the way the heart pumps blood and the lungs breathe air. That's its function. That's its function. It doesn't mean that it's conscious. In yoga techniques, you, you, you learn to become conscious of your breathing. That's the first thing you do. And then you learn you practice being conscious of your heart rate. And I get by feedback. And then you practice mindful thinking, which is very, very difficult to do. As anybody who's ever tried it will testify. You try mindfully thinking, you can last for about 30 seconds. Yeah. Less <laughs> when you first start. It's a very hard discipline, but it can be learned. So that's the idea. Uh, and then dreaming and lucid dreaming. Dreaming is dreaming, you're always uh, looking at the stream of images in your mind, in your mind and then uh, lucid dreaming would be the, the choosing, you're intentionally looking at it and choosing to develop it in some way. Okay, let's do the next slide. Oh, I know, wow. But that's okay. That's all right, I'm not going to worry about it because mm -hmm. I want you to ask the questions that will be meaningful to you. So this is like what I call, uh, this actually doesn't apply to um, the consciousness expansion idea. But this applies to other kinds of uh, variations in consciousness and energy. I call this two dimensions of all the states. The energy dimension, high energy and low energy, or high arousal, low arousal, and uh, a little of pain, heaven and hell on the night. So you could have four, you, so I listed, uh, you know, so the, the energy dimension is just how much energy you have, and how awake you are, in other words. So the, the EEG differences on the vertical dimension, uh, all the way down to, you know, if you have low energy in you know, the EEG, you're in the sleep state, different stages of sleep, dreaming, and then the high energy, high excitement. Then the, the horizontal dimension is pleasure, pain, or heaven and hell. So you have four main groups of possibility. You have high pleasure and high energy, and that would be like ecstasy. Ecstasy is like, uh, very pleasurable and high energy. And uh, contrast that with low energy, peaceful energy, but very pleasurable. That would be like bliss, maybe. Uh, or uh, the difference, the image difference would be like a waterfall or a fountain. You feel fantastically good about a fountain. You have a 
fountains of measurable sensation. And then a peaceful lake, where you're just calm and meditating, very blissful, but nothing is happening. It's very peaceful. You see, quiet, tranquil, tranquility. And uh, then a similar uh, two things on the left side, the negative side, um, there's, there's a high energy house, uh, where, like mania, actually, uh, which, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, terror, terror, you know, PTSD is a high energy hell. The people who are you know, PTSD, they're not depressed. They're ready to shoot. You know, they're incredibly hyper aroused. Hyper aroused, they can read that down. And uh, vigilance, like that. Terror, rage. Um, rage, you see, which are, which are actually sort of some, partly on the right hand side, is a very interesting high energy state. Uh, because, and I put it on the right side, because rage is notorious for the fact that it's not unpleasant. It's the most difficult feeling to work with. Anxiety, everybody knows it's, un it's unpleasant and wants to get out of it. Uh, terror is the same thing. People who are enraged don't necessarily want to do other. They don't feel a need to do anything else but hit something or yell at someone. That's not the most difficult condition to work with in oneself and in others. And then low energy, you know, low pleasure would be what we all know, depression. Um, you know, sick, feeling sick, have no energy, no motivation to get up or do anything. And uh, low energy, pleasurable, peaceful state. And uh, I've, I've listed the, the stimulant and depressive drugs as cutting across the pleasure pain dimension. Because of whether it's pleasurable or painful depends on the way you what you're starting point. Is. So if you take a, if you're depressed and you take a stimulant, you feel better because, but you're not, you haven't necessarily expanded your awareness, you see. You just, uh, uh, you just moved up the scale from low energy to higher energy and you feel okay, this is good, it's a good thing to do. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, I put, um, uh, marijuana is sort of, uh, is sort of like on the, on the right side, it's pleasurable, and, but it is a tranquilizer. So your energy is low, just the uh, marijuana, why? Because it doesn't feel like doing anything. That's one of the reasons why it's, it's healthy, you see. You can see people are too much, too much, too much. Okay, let's leave that. The psychedelic drugs, you couldn't map on that map because you have, they go all over the place. They can go for all four of them and do it in 10 minutes. So, uh, okay. let's go. So God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. This is the one on Alphonse Alamas. So anyway, Alphonse Alamas is a phenomenally beautiful and powerful and effective social healing movement, method and movement that uh, relies on the affinity and the social connection between people uh, to help people get out of alcoholics and other kinds of addiction. And uh, there's a, if you go on a, a website, there are a lot, a lot of, I would tell you, and, a lot of theories about who invented it, who came up with it. And finally, I think they found it in a 19th century German castle house. Uh, they found it in there. And they used it, what uh, gave it in Gelassenheit. Gelassen, Gelassen and Gelassenheit is one of my favorite words in German because it's, uh, it means letting be mess. It's not exactly equivalent to serenity. It's not, it has, doesn't have the same word root. Literally, lasting is letting, and the velocity means letting, the adjective, and uh, the lasting height means letting be, and that's the quality of being sort of calm and accepting for whatever is happening. Okay, so we're already on to the, what I call the Janus model, in which um, uh, the, the, this is what I use for, as a model for healing and divination prophecy. So in the present, this is the present field of your awareness and identity. So identity, the self, is not, this is the way to get out of the thing. This is a relational system. This is a system of relations rather than people and things, things like things. That relations are fundamental. When you think about it, you can, you can prove this to yourself. Every one of us is, a, is fundamentally at their most core of being. Uh, and you couldn't be unless you uh, implies a relationship, for example, every one of us 
is the son or the daughter of the man and the woman we call a parent. That's pretty basic when you say, I mean, you couldn't be you or anything else if you didn't have a mother and father. And you may also have brothers and sisters, you may also have children, you may also have employers or employees, that's a relation if you work for a job. Uh, and the relations can be not only with other people, they can be with animals, they can be with plants, they can be with the environment, they can be with the nation state in which you are a participant. Like that. Political party can be relationship uh, of yourself to the cosmos. Einstein used to say the most important question anyone can answer for themselves is do I feel safe in the universe? Do I feel safe in the universe? Kind of an interesting psychological question for a physicist to come up with, don't you think? So uh, the processes of healing involve going into the past, connection, connecting with an incident in the past, or an infection, or a wounding, or whatever it may be, and then remembering, uh, which means reconnecting, what is the dismembered, into the present. Not enough just to go into the past. It's a futile thing to do with that, you know. And then saying with the future is exactly how it is. Like the future and the past mirror each other. So there's an image or a vision of where you want to go, where you, what you want to be, what I want to be when I grow up, the child says. And then there's the integrating that, which I call uh, realizing it, making it real. No, not that, that, the vision. And if you don't make it real, what is it? And that's what the next slide will say. And yes, so let's end with this slide. So intention uh, and integration with uh, intention, past and future, with and without integration. So, intentional memory, with conscious integration, is remembering, and leads to healing and increased wholeness. Unconscious memory, without integration, is flashback, regression, and leads to hopelessness, or useless nostalgia. Intentional vision with conscious integration is inspiration and leads to realization and creative expression. Unconscious vision without integration is fantasy and leads to loss of faith and pointless distractions. So I think I'll end there and invite you to do questions. And then uh, exactly parallel, that's the point of the Janus 
listen, if I get call it Janus, but Janus is a Roman deity that has two faces, one of them looks like a computer, and the month of January comes from that, you know, and so forth. So you, you have a vision, but then it's not enough to have a vision, because it is, when you don't do anything about it, it's a fantasy. Now, you have to make it real. Uh, a vision of yourself. It's like a little boy who said, well, I'm going to be a doctor. Well, then, okay, so I went to the doctor, and he just goes up, he's going to go to the school and make it real. He said, because he can change his mind any time. That's okay. Well, I'm forced to do it. And he may not uh, actually be a doctor, but he may write novels about being a doctor, which would be okay too, he said. But there's, there's a similar double movement. You have a vision that pro projects into the future, and then you bring it back, you make it real. Like a realization. Does that make sense? Thank you, Mark. Um, it's uh, interesting uh, that you say that you think MDMA is more useful clinical tool than classical hallucinogens. Uh, as a clinician, I quite agree. Um, I'm quite interested to know what Tim Gillian's take was on MDMA. Um, what what his experiences and his um, opinion on What, what? Tim Gillian's opinion on MDMA. Uh, I don't think Leary didn't have much uh, awareness or contact with him. That was after his time. That was in the 80s. I mean, he was still alive when he tried it, but he didn't, yeah, I, he didn't yeah. think it was particularly interesting. I mean, I know he wasn't using it. He wasn't using it earlier in his life, obviously. No. But he, it was around for yeah, like, 20, 30 years. He didn't years. find it particularly interesting. I don't find it particularly interesting, actually. As a drug to take, I don't see the point of taking. Now, if I have relationship issues that I want to work out, which I do sometimes have, <laughs> then I might very well want to take it with my partner or something like that. Provided that is legal, but the doctor stops. But um, other than that, I don't see any particular reason to take But I've used it when, I, when it was still legal as, as a therapy tool. I think it's on time. And the fact that you don't have like hallucinations and visions is exactly the exact kind of joke. But you wouldn't, for example, I would not, and people do not use MDMA for end of life studies. Because the end of life person who's dying of a terminal disease is not looking for more life energy. <laughs> he, he or she is looking for detachment. So that's where this. The consciousness expanding of like psilocybin and LSD come into their own. They have to be addressed for that. Does that make sense? Thank you. At the very back. Hi there. And one of the quotes you put up was to do with. Um, you have to speak up. One of the quotes you put up was to do with uh, not having practices for things and that being a generally quite good state. I wonder if one of your view is on drugs that are described as risky addictive that may take away someone. Can you try again a little louder? Which quote was it? Oh, sorry. Okay, so the, um, one of the slides was about preference and the idea of, uh, of not having a particular preference. Oh, yeah, the dogs came down this one here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I wondered how, in relation to that uh, desire, what your thoughts are in regards to drugs that have uh, a physical addiction and could effectively take over someone's conscious ability to make any decision over a preference because it's got such a strong physical take on their body. Well, I think, uh, see that Taoist uh, statement is, is a philosophy of life. <laughs> of course you have preferences, and I do, and we all do. You know, you have to sit down to a meal, you have to decide what you're going to eat, and express what you're not going to eat, and that's normal life. He's talking about a meditation, you know, where you eliminate all the preferences in order to get to this kind of unit of state. Now, if you, you know, if you have an addiction, addictive pattern, then you've got a, a person, an individual, who's, whose uh, appetite system is, is screwed up, basically, in an addictive pattern, and then that needs to be addressed first before you can, you know, have any chance of uh, meditating. You see, I think, I think state of rage and state of fear are two basic alter states of consciousness ongoing that we fall into that are completely dysfunctional. And therapy involves, you know, uh, and, and growing, it, you can't function in those states. You know, uh, the, 
you have to put that first the priority of you know, doing that thing. Every psychotherapist knows it. Every martial artist knows that, for example. In martial arts training, uh, with the sword or whatever it is, if you get enraged, you lost. You lost right there. You lost your temper, you lost, you lost the game. You lost the, the thing. So consciousness comes first. Because then you can choose what to do. Because both rage and fear are fixated, contracted states. You know, just want to kill or hurt them. That person, or the pulled out. So that's the first priority. It's instinctive, it's basic, it's instinctive, it's necessary to survival. You don't get rid of all fear. You get rid of the neurotic fears that you acquired in the course of your upbringing that are inappropriate and unnecessary. You don't, you don't lose the ability to be afraid so that because it's an instinctive survival process. When you step on a curb and out of the corner of your eye you see a truck coming down, you jump back. You don't bother to expand consciousness and see what kind of truck it is exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just act. So I don't believe, I don't agree with the therapists who claim that people think I'm going to get rid of all my kids. So you can't do it. Can't be done. What if you want to get rid of the neurotic fears, the acquired fears, and you know, of course, we'll keep the instinct. Um, yeah, my question goes a bit beyond what you what you talked about today. But since you're a consciousness researcher as well, I would like to ask something that has been uh, bothering me for uh, for a while. Like um, uh, assuming that there is something like collective consciousness and subconsciousness. Uh, what, what is your idea about the connection between the individual consciousness and the collective consciousness? Yes, uh, yes, there is collective consciousness and there is individual consciousness. The individual consciousness is the consciousness of your family. Your family has a certain kind of consciousness, certain kinds of feelings, interests. Your community, your community has some shared goals and values, and you know, your friends, your neighbors, and that. Society, the system's real. The society has certain goals and values and you know things like that. And uh, um, whether you're in the United States of America, whether you're in England, whether you're in Germany, the nation has a kind of consciousness. Nationalism is a sort of a perverted fixation on the nation state and a kind of inappropriate superiority attached to one nation to another. It's not necessary, it's completely destructive on a, a social political level, as we all have a nation go to war for one another. That's necessary, it's not given that nations can live peacefully with one another. And then there's global consciousness, the whole earth. And then there's consciousness of the solar system. And then there's consciousness of the galaxy. And then there's cosmic consciousness. So it's a system. The system's view, you see, can accommodate subsystems at every level. And then you can go down into the microcosmos as well, because the different organs can be in different states of consciousness. For example, the heart might be in one state of consciousness, the heart head might be in another. That's really well known. And even cells have consciousness. And even atoms and molecules have consciousness. So it's consciousness or unconsciousness all the way up and down, you see. As above, so below. That's what people are confident to say. Well, there is a continuum. There is a continuum. There is a many continuum. So you say that there is another like part underneath all this. Different, there are different paradigms of consciousness. I want to mention that state of consciousness is one paradigm. And, you know, it's a period of time in which your consciousness functions according to certain characteristic ways, and it's different from before and after. That's one paradigm. And the other paradigm of consciousness is sort of something that is added to the sort of cloud. Of, uh, extra awareness that's happening. And then there's another kind of way of looking at consciousness in the developmental. You could get the consciousness of, a, of an infant, uh, a neonate, with the consciousness of a six-year-old child, and then an adolescent with a different, probably different state of consciousness, but it's a different attitude to life. And a different, you know, so the idea of the life cycle, uh, midlife, uh, old age, like that. I think it's time. Yeah, it's time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.